I'm Tim Ventura, and in this presentation, Peter Reale and Rich Hoffman will be discussing the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. The SEU is a think tank of scientists, former military and law enforcement officials, and other professionals who seek evidence-based answers to UAP questions. Peter Reale has a BS and MSEE from the University of California, Berkeley. He had a long career in Silicon Valley as an electrical design engineer and manager of engineering projects. His specialty was in telecommunications and network information technologies. Rich Hoffman has a BA in organizational communications from Wright State University. He's an information technology consultant and strategist. He's worked as a defense contractor for over 20 years, working primarily for the Army Material Command HQ with a variety of companies. Well, I'll, I'll be glad to start it. And I'm going to share a screen here for a second. I've got a presentation that talks about how we got started as SU and a little bit about us. And hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, let me see. Oh, let me increase the size here. Yeah, that, that looks wonderful. And okay. again, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Oh, it's 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 a pleasure to be able to join you all. Uh, and, and thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me move to the, <clears throat> the next slide here. Basically, a uh, little bit about uh, SCU in terms of how we got started. First off, uh, just to clarify that we got started early on, uh, actually way before we formed as an organization. We uh, uh, there were five of us, including Larry Cates, who is by the way on this call right now, and and he's in the community. Uh, but myself, Larry Cates, uh, Robert Powell, you had Morgan Bell, uh, and you had a Carl Paulson, got together in uh, roughly around the uh, 2013 time frame to actually study a. Uh, a video that was released to us uh, from the Homeland Security uh, a, a Department. Uh, it was actually a Customs and Border uh, Patrol aircraft that was in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. And all of us had been, uh, are, were members of MUFON uh, and held different kinds of positions in that, but we all managed to come together from the standpoint of science. Uh, Robert Powell was the uh, Director of Research. I was uh, state director. In addition to that, I was also playing a deputy director of investigations at the or for the organization, as well as I got into a director role looking at strategic projects, which was based about, you know, doing technology uh, uh, pushes of technology, if you would, to the field for study. Uh, so anyway, bottom line is we got started with this case uh, and spent uh, about a year and a half to almost close to two years studying the uh, three minute and 54 second video that was handed to us. Uh, and uh, each, each of us took different roles to write different parts of the paper. Uh, Larry did a, a great analysis and he was our mathematician to be able to help us to, to do the study. Uh, we had uh, a physicist, Carl Paulson, that was on board. Uh, Robert Powell comes out of the, uh, the semiconductor industry area. Uh, Morgan Bell is working with uh, environmental services and stuff like that. And then, of course, I worked uh, in the IT department over for Army Material Command here at uh, Redstone Arsenal. And so we decided to form a team, basically. Uh, and we called ourselves basically uh, the Scientific Coalition for Ufology. It's, we just came up with a SU name for ourselves, if you would. And, uh, and then uh, we basically after that period of time we put together a, like 177 page document on the video in terms of our findings uh and then uh went from there to to basically uh, uh find out that mufon wasn't thrilled about the fact that we didn't go through them but we had signed a non-disclosure agreement saying that we weren't going to do that uh they didn't want this to go through ufo channels uh and so basically we had to keep it clear from them and do this uh, separate. And anyway, bottom line was that uh, we uh, saw some changes in MUFON that we didn't like as a, an organization. Uh, and a lot of the scientific community actually left the organization. Uh, and we decided in uh, roughly around 2016 to kind of like start uh, a, an organization and make it more formalized. 
And, uh, and so then by 2017, we, we got started as a scientific coalition for ufology. And then later on we, in 2019, we decided to change our name to more of like the scientific coalition for UAP studies. Uh, and we, that was a, a change to get away kind of, you know, from that term UFOs, which uh, always has a stigma associated with it. Uh, we chose to use UAP in the context of aerospace phenomena as opposed to the typical aerial phenomena. Because, I mean, you start to have to include uh, the fact that these things are water, they traverse in water, they traverse in air, and then there are also some reports that uh, of space kind of like uh, anomalies being seen. So it covers the gamut. And if you look in, in the military world, aerospace actually means kind of like all three of those mediums. Uh, anyway, so uh, then we, we decided that we we're going to be a 501c3 charitable organization, and we set that up, and we incorporated in the state of Florida on August 2nd, 2018. Uh, we're way over 125 members now. I think we're up at the, the last count was something like about 155 members. Uh, most have advanced degrees from countless disciplines. We got all different kinds of things like scientists, engineers, uh, ex-military, former military law officers, uh, and then a whole host of business professionals. And as you pointed out already, you've, you know, you've had a great number of us that uh, have been on your, uh, uh, on the APIC uh, conference. We've had Detlef Hoyer is also a part of SCU. I don't even know if you knew him or not, but Kevin Knuth, Matthew Shadegas, uh, Frank Milburn, uh, and a number of, uh, of others probably are, <laughs> will be on or something like that, but we're all part of SCU and decided to, uh, to go that route. Uh, basically our, our mission, just to give you an under, and, and how we chose to, to look at this is, we were basically wanting to conduct and promote and encourage rigorous scientific examination of UAP. I mean, previously in my 57 years now of study of the UFOs uh, or UF, UAP phenomena, but uh, it's been sorely lacking to have scientists really truly engage collectively on this subject. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to get a scientific approach dedicated solely to the phenomena and really looking at it and doing the, the right things, you know, putting together, you know, hypotheses, testing the hypotheses, looking at uh, getting, putting together papers, having those peer reviewed and getting them out there and then even published in, you know, some sort of a journal. Uh, we also, you know, obviously endeavored to use scientific principles, as I just got through saying, to study the phenomena. Uh, then we also look at uh, scientific analysis support, you know, witness testimony and other, and, and working with other scientific organizations and governments who are looking for the certitude of facts. We uh, seek to share the credible data with the public, the government, and scientific institutions so we can further our understanding of the, the phenomena. And we're basically looking to be able to share our data. We want to be as transparent as possible. So if you take a look at, for example, at our website, the papers we put together, we published them and put them on our site and let everybody take a look at them. So we're not about not sharing at all. And that's been a problem in the UFO community for a long, long time. Uh, our goals uh, are to basically establish a foundation of, of you, know, you know, credible objective scientific study. Also, to, we're partnering uh, with a lot of different organizations, for example, uh, UAPX, we're partnered with. We're uh, partnered with the uh, Center for UFO Studies, and we're we're partnered with uh, also uh, you know a, a number of others uh, as well. So uh, we're we're looking to sponsor uh, you know different public networking environments. Uh, we have our our own way of connecting out to those, uh, and we publish a, a a newsletter as well as we've been engaged. In, in like, you know, having conversations like this one uh, in scientific organizations. And so we're looking to be able to help promote the study of UAPs. Uh, right now, they, the board of directors are, my, of course, myself, Robert Powell, uh, Morgan Bell, uh, Peter Rielli, who's on the call here. Uh, you have uh, Dr. Paul Kingsbury. Uh, you've got Larry Hancock. And then we have two people that are emeritus. Uh, Larry Cates, as I told you, is on is right now attending this conference, uh, and Carl Paulson are both emeritus. 
Then we have, uh, and this is outdated now. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that changed. Uh, Jonathan Lace has just left us and we now have uh, Stephen Purcell who's taken over the role of public relations officer. Uh, Steve Sharples is helping us out with senior IT program management. He helps with the website. And then we have a, a board of advisors, if you would. Uh, we've got uh, Sarah Little, who is uh, our science advisor. Alejandro Rojas is doing media and PR work. Uh, we have a Dr. Joseph uh, Donato, Donato uh, who is also our national security advisor. And uh, it's, this is incorrect. It's not doctor yet, but he's working on it. He's just about there getting his doctorship. And I made a mistake on that, but it's Josh Pearson. He's our intelligence security advisor. So we're actually trying to reach out at the same time into the, uh, the, the intelligence world, if you would, and build that relationship uh, between the two of us, because we can get a direct benefit from having conversations with the uh, IC. Um, these are just a list of some of our current projects that we've got ongoing. Uh, there's a study called the Intention Study. And this is a group of people that are out, you know, our, our members that are basically looking and analyzing the nuclear kind of cases uh, where you have uh, UFOs that are hanging around production, storage, testing sites, uh, and also, you know, on, on naval ships and a whole host of other things. But We've initially started off with looking at like the production sites. And so we're focusing on right now the Hanford plant up in the state of Washington uh, to see if we can derive any kind of an intention about what is it that their interest is in that nuclear kind of uh, case. And we obviously know about cases that are around the world like Malmstrom and you know uh, the, where they actually deactivate missiles or they accidentally activate missiles in Russia. But ultimately we're, uh, we're trying to find out what is it they're doing and can we derive any kind of intention? Uh, the, uh, the other, another one of our studies that we're looking at is a USO UAP kind of like a geographic statistical study. Where are the proponents of the cases with water sightings? Uh, can we derive any kind of, you know, intelligence if you would from looking at that? Uh, we see that there's a, a correlation with, you know, off the coast of California. Certainly, if you look at the Tic Tac cases and all the other kind of cases going on, you can relatively uh, make the deduction that that's a hot area. Uh, Puerto Rico in itself is also another one of those areas. We see a lot of cases. There are a tremendous amount of historical data uh, in, in that. But we're looking at other areas, you know. I mean, what about, you know, European countries and various other things that, that uh, other parts of the world that, do they have the same kind of thing with water interaction? Uh, we're also looking at a UAP characterization wow. study. Looking at some of the, 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 the looking at the now. best cases that we can <laughs> uh, to deduce what we can about their shapes, any of uh, their maneuverability, uh, colors, any other kind of characteristics, if you would, that we can see uh, over history of some of the best cases uh, uh, that are out there. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, looking at uh, coronal mass ejections if, and solar activity. Is there any relationship between that uh, and UFO or UAP reports? And uh, so if you take a look at, you know, a good number of the uh, earth light phenomena that's, that's like out there, uh, hang on, sorry. Uh, the, you know, earth light phenomena was kind of a, a, an unusual uh, kind of like things that always get mixed up as being UAPs. Uh, there's a lot of times that, that uh, it's believed that they're related to, uh, you know, like solar activity. Um, then you have uh, another one, which is looking at UAPs and sounds. So we're trying to find out, you know, well, mostly that they're silent. There are a lot of uh, cases that actually have sounds. Uh, and, you know, typically if you have people that report, or report a buzzing or a humming or some other kind of like noise uh, that's that's uh, related to the actual objects. And so we're trying to, to look at that as well as to deduce what tools can allow us to hear in other parts of the, uh, the, the uh, range of uh, uh, the spectrum, if you would, to be able to capture things that might not be heard by human. Um, then, uh, there's a, a psychological evaluation of UAP encounter study. There's a group of us that are actually looking into that uh, as well. 
uh, to try to deduce. What, and we have, a, again, a number of people that are, that are psychologists and have that kind of be, behavioral kind of science, if you would, that are, are wanting to explore some of that. Uh, we have UAP propulsion effects in the atmosphere and water. Uh, there's a, a tremendous uh, number of books that are out there that, that detail, for example, uh, you know, the, uh, the, U, the USO cases and, and the interactions with water. Uh, then you have like the book like by Paul Hill, where it's called Unconventional Flying Objects, where he talks about the fact that, you know, you know, the, the water is boiling, if you would. Uh, there's a lot of steam coming off of the uh, uh, off of the, the surface of the water. And then, and then there's other uh, other cases when you don't see that, you know, and uh, some people have actually reported like almost like a snowfall, if you would, uh, around the craft as it's coming out of the water. So ultimately, it's it's looking at that. You you've got uh, you're looking at uh, you know the, we're also re-looking at the Delphos, Kansas case, uh, which is of course a very famous case of. Uh, Soil being uh, basically irradiated, if you would, and glowed for four days. Uh, even the tree glowed, uh, and it was witnessed by the, the, some of the people there. And the the mother actually went out and touched her leg, and it became numb. And so there's a whole bunch of interesting things uh, about that particular case at, that we're relooking. So that gives you a little bit of a a, a number of uh, the projects that we're actually engaged in. Let me uh, go to the next slide here. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, some of our papers that we've had published. Uh, one was talking about the estimating flight characteristics of anomalous unidentified aerial vehicles in the 2004 Nimitz encounter. Uh, we had uh, another paper that was published uh, with the same kind of information. Uh, we have a forensic analysis of the Navy strike group 11's encounter with an anomalous aerial ve uh, vehicle. We uh, Many of us took a took a look at, at that initial encounter when it happened, uh, or when we became aware of it. Let me put it that way. Uh, uh, Robert got us started. He uh, actually talked with the uh, uh, Paco Chirici. I, I guess that's how you say it. I'm not sure, uh, but anyway, he had written an article in the uh, Fighter Suite uh, publication, and uh, anyway, that kind of got us kicked off, and then we formed a team and started looking into it. I also mentioned that the 2013 Aguadilla Puerto Rico case that uh, we kind of took a look at and we published that report. And then also Robert Powell was engaged when he was still with MUFON as the director of research. He helped publish a uh, paper that was on the Stephenville Lights, a comprehensive radar and witness report study. So we've been actively trying to publish papers and working on a whole bunch of papers with the projects we're working on. Uh, kind of list of the uh, the kinds of capabilities some that we have, and we're trying to always kind of expand that out. But you know, everything from case investigations. A lot of us have got like you know, oodles of years and decades doing case investigations, uh, and and how to do those properly. Uh, and then how do you look at photos and video and and do that analysis of the of the videos? We've uh, got a lot of experience around that. Of course, doing that with the Nimitz case, as well as the Aguadilla case and other cases, you know. So it's not like we haven't been looking at uh, video and photos. Uh, isotope analysis we've done. Uh, we've done, uh, in fact, that was on the Ubatuba case. We've done some of that work. We've done, worked with acoustic signatures analysis. And as you may or may not know, there's signatures management going on with many of these objects. Uh, where they're able to do things like jamming and, and having electromagnetic effects that can shut down navigation systems or missiles or that type of thing. Uh, and then, of course, theoretical analysis of that. Some of the research uh, we've done is chemical signatures, material science, and mathematical statistical modeling. And we're doing that with a, a number of the things that we're engaged in right now. And of course, we, we help with doing peer reviews for others as well. So if you have an interest in having us peer review that, we can do that. We, uh, we're also putting out there the fact that we can work, you know, with, of course, with government agencies. And we've had engagements trying to encourage, you know, the, the whole Pentagon task force and a number of others to be able to start sharing data and getting that out to the scientific world, if you would. Uh, that needs to happen with people from academia or people like us or, you know, just getting that out there because 
that's going to help us to be able to get an understanding of this uh, phenomena. And then we've been connecting with, you know, everything from people on, you know, up on the hill already. Uh, we're making uh, sincere connections with a, a number of senators and, and various other people uh, to encourage uh, that they get this thing uh, studied properly. Uh, we're also, we can support academic institutions in, and help them in their studies because we've got this rich history of uh, many of us being in the UFO phenomena for a long time. And then, of course, working with partners and research organizations as well. So we're, we're hoping that we can, you know, do that uh, and, in terms of making good, strong connections and, uh, and really getting a great team of people that are willing to actually do the hard work to be able to study this phenomenon the right way. Uh, we have a variety of ways, you, you know, people are joining uh, SU. There's, uh, there's we've got partners, of course, I mentioned. Uh, we have community access members. We formerly called them affiliates, but now they're community access members. And so there's a lot of people that are you know, checking us out at first and then deciding whether they want to contribute uh, in some form, uh, like working on projects or in some capacity. Uh, and then we have senior contributing members. So if you are interested in joining us, I can show you. Uh, there's a contact page up on our, our website, or you can send an email to exploringscu at gmail.com. And that will allow you to get connected to us. Uh, I mentioned that we have partners. I mentioned the Center for UFO Studies, uh, Jalen Heineck Center. Uh, a lot of us were working with a project called UFO, UFO Data. Uh, and that's basically, again, creating some sort of a technology capability that you can in place where you can capture data from hotspots or something of that nature. We're working with UAPX, as I mentioned. Uh, in fact, by the way, uh, Dr. Kevin Knuth was just promoted to a uh, vice president role uh, of, of that organization. Uh, and we have NARCAP that we're also engaged with. Uh, NARCAP, of course, was uh, Dick Haynes looking at a lot of the uh, aircraft safety in relationship to UFOs uh, or UAP. And he's done a tremendous amount of work. And Ted Rowe has pick, uh, picked up from, uh, after uh, Dick retired uh, and is carrying on and doing a fabulous job. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's it. We have a website that, that's out there called explorescu.org. Uh, uh, we have a Facebook presence. Uh, we have a Twitter account that we've got. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. And uh, as well as that, we're on YouTube. And we try to keep up with, uh, again, informing people about the subject and our studies. Uh, through these different means. Uh, in fact, let me switch gears for a second out of this, if you don't mind. Uh, I was going to show you uh, on our website here. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. It's the explorescu.org. Uh, we've, we've got a, a number of things up there uh, talking about who we are, mission services team, uh, we've been keeping in the news and putting things up there to help people to, uh, to keep informed. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's a, you can go up there and look at about us and you can, again, learn more about our work and what we're doing. Uh, we're connected to a lot of people. We do collaboration work. We do the research. Rich, uh, I, your, your image is frozen. It didn't go up to the, X, the to the site, to the SEU site. It's just showing uh the oh. last uh, slide kind of bent as it's trying to okay, change well, over. So. Yeah, well, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, maybe I, Rich, let me stop your screen share and then you can you can share again. If, if, yeah. If you, okay. Let's try that. Okay, I, I apologize. Let me uh, share the screen again. And that's just that wonderful, uh, like unusual kinds of aspects, right? About, um, can you see that? Yes. Is it scrolling as I scroll now? Yeah, yeah. Yep. It, it must have just frozen before. It looks great now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I apologize, and I'm glad you you know chimed in there. Uh, so about uh, you know again, it, th this is the, the the our website. We've got a, again talking about the collaboration that we're trying to be able to do and the research that we're trying to do. Uh, there's also uh, the team. If you're 
kind of curious about all of us as far as who the board of directors are. We're pretty much here. You can learn about us and, uh, and who we're uh, who we are in greater detail from that um, by looking at that. And there, of course, there's Larry Cates, who's on the on this conference, as I told you about. Um, and uh, so anyway, get up there are, are in the library area. If you take a look at the library area, you'll find out that this is where we post our, our papers. Uh, there's also like the Aguadilla video and some of the other video clips that we've actually analyzed. Uh, and and our, even our newsletters are the, that we put together are, are located up here, uh, as well as other key documents that, that are coming. And so we've been trying to post and keep everybody informed about what's going on with us and, and, and all the, the latest and greatest documents. So, uh, by all means, if you get a chance to get up there, uh, you can check that out and read our papers uh, that we've got, as well as look at the videos on like uh, that we've studied. So I encourage you to, to get up there, check it out. Uh, there are project uh, page up there. And uh, there's a number of people that actually would like to be able to do a project or have an idea for a project. And Certainly, uh, we can, you know, try to help out with projects. We get a lot of people that want to be able to uh, recommend ideas of where we can go and what we can do. But again, it's about bringing the right parties and players together. And then our conferences, we have a conference pretty much every year, uh, except we couldn't do it last year because of COVID. Uh, and we had to cancel that that one. Uh, but this year we had one in and there you know this year in june it's the first weekend in june uh we had the 2021 conference and actually it was we did it completely uh you know as a as basically a live stream if, if you would uh and we used a great tool that was a great conference tool that uh that was really really excellent uh and we had uh, you know 250 people and a good presence from people around the world that attended this conference so our our next conference next year will we're hoping to have both an in person as well as a live stream kind of an event so it'll be a hybrid uh, and uh, you'll you'll be able to come up to our website and be able to find out uh, you know when that is and when it's scheduled this year we had you know Dr Hal Putoff we had Matthew Shadegas we had a whole host of other people that talked about everything in our first year 2019. We had a lot of it focused on propulsion because we, it was right outside of the gate of uh, Redstone Arsenal, and of course with the Marshall Space Flight Center, there you know you're you're dealing with propulsion experts. So uh, we're going to be having it again here in Huntsville, Alabama, and it'll be the uh, first weekend in June of 2022. So hopefully, if uh, if you are interested, please do uh, join us. There's also a, a contact page I was going to point out over here where if you have an interest in contacting us, you can you can do that as well as uh, supporting us. Uh, so I just wanted to show you that I'm going to switch uh, out of this and go back over if I can and, and maybe I'll have to do the stopping to share the screen again <laughs> and switch back. Uh, uh, let me do that right now and bring that uh back up here let's see hang on one second well let me uh see what's going on here Okay, now I'm going to go to the share screen and it should come up. For some odd reason, it was not showing up in the pick choice in, uh, and it's still not for some odd reason. It's software. <laughs> yeah, don't you love it? You know, you want to be able to go over and, and to bring it up and it's not for some odd reason showing up now. When I want to be able to go and choose it for the share. Oh, is this something that I could assist with from our end, or? Uh, well, I you don't have, I don't think you have the presentation, but anyway, 
Uh, let me see if I can do this a second here again. And I apologize while we do this wonderful. Trying to switch out from my Apex slides here. And they are showing as open. Well, okay. Bottom line was I, that was pretty much. No, I'm going to get out of this because that's pretty much it anyway. And and why why go about trying to put you through this painful thing? Uh, anyway, uh, that's for the most part uh, who and what we're about. Uh, we're uh, we're growing. I'm glad to see it. I can share with you that in my 57 years with this subject, starting at age 13, uh, I've been. I had the pleasure of working with the people, some of the people at Project Blue Book in Dayton, Ohio. So I was connected at that level. Uh, and now to be able to see that there's this uh, governmental activity around the subject right now, it's pretty thrilling, if you would. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll shut up here for a second. Peter, did you have anything you'd like to add about SCU? Well, uh, you've given a very comprehensive uh background far better than I could have and I'm glad you, you did that. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think everyone here probably has a pretty good idea of what we do. So, I mean, I, I can talk about myself. <laughs> uh, yeah. If, yeah are, are you done, Rich? Uh, I can be. Uh, you know, I, okay. I know that I mentioned to Tim about the idea that that you know, we, I know you got engaged uh, and immediately jumped in on the, uh, the Nimitz case. Of course, I, you know, I could, we could talk about the, uh, the Aguadilla case as well uh, and some of the things. I know that that was- Well, uh, let me talk a little, uh, talk about right ahead. a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm a latecomer to the SCU. I mean, uh, uh, I came in about 2018. Uh, my background is, uh, you know, I was an electronics engineer, I have a master's in uh, communication engineering. And uh, I worked in Silicon Valley many years, but I'm a design engineer, you know, uh, I have to design products. And uh, so I'm now uh, the director of uh, products at uh, product director of the SCU. I, I got that handed to me, you know, because, uh, but I'm uh, probably a, a fairly skeptical. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty skeptical person. You. Uh, I've kind of known, <laughs> known for that in the SCU. Um, but I've been interested in the subject for many years. I, I'm retired now. I live in Boise, Idaho. Uh, but I, I lived in California, of course, since all my life, born and raised in San Francisco. Um, and uh, even as a, you know, through the years, I uh, read books and, and, and became kind of convinced there was something to this. Um, although, a lot of the, uh, but I, I like, uh, I like to have facts and data, uh, you know, being an engineer, I, you know, it's, it's a proof things because, uh, uh, and currently I still feel that way. I feel a large majority of the reports are natural phenomena or, you know, uh, conventional objects misidentified and whatever, but there's a small subset of machines, you know, that are clearly uh, you know, clearly have properties and abilities that, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, we can't currently do. And uh, so I came in about 20, I, I was, uh, I actually contacted MUFON uh, because I, I don't know, something got me started thinking about this. I'm retired, you know, what do I do now? Well, I, I'm a foot photographer. You can see back here, I, I, that's a, one of my primary interests. Uh, I, I, I like to do photography. And, uh, but, you know, I, I had some spare time. So uh, I, I started looking into, uh, you know, this subject. I've read a lot of books over the years, uh, but um, I, 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 you know, with the TV and the, all of the um, sensational things that are on TV and everything, uh, I, I just didn't like the way the subject was treated. You know, I wanted to find some kind of scientific analysis of this thing and uh, you know if you if you read a little bit into the subject you 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 know back to the condon report and those kind of things it's been taboo for uh scientists and engineers or anybody uh who's uh involved in this subject uh 
on a professional basis to get involved because it's th career threatening and uh, pilots and airlines uh, don't want to report it. The, the pilots could get, uh, you know, lose their jobs. The airlines are worried that people are going to stop flying as much. They're going to lose things because these things could be a hazard. You know, I mean, they're uh, flying around without lights, a lot of them, and uh, you, there could be a collision. And, you know, so that uh, NARCAP, you know, was involved in a lot of that. But it's very, it's been very difficult to get scientists. Uh, there, there's, there's definitely a group of uh, scientists that kind of like, uh, kind of investigate this on their own and talk to one another. But it, you can't get a, if, if you write a report, currently you can't get it published in any, any kind of journals or anything. They just, you know, especially with the UFO uh, community and, and, and the, way it's, the way it's been occurring, you can't get anything published. So I came in, uh, I, I, I was searching after talking to MUFON, I just didn't think that the director I was talking to was scientifically based. Uh, and so I, that, that kind of discouraged me. So I gave up for a while. And then I came across a website uh, that Robert Powell had, uh, had put up about the SCU and it, they said they were scientifically based. And so that attracted me. So I contacted him and that led to my joining uh, in 2018. And I, uh, was work, I worked on the uh, SCU paper with him for about a year and a half. I mean, these papers take a long time. Uh, Robert is extraordinary in his detailed, uh, he interviewed me. Okay, uh, just as a background, the Tic Tac case, we were working on it a year before it even became public in the New York Times. Uh, and uh, we had interviewed many of them, uh, uh, many of them, a, a subset of the pilots and uh, people and radar operators that were involved in this. And so uh, we knew there was something to it. And uh, we actually, recorded their uh, sessions and stuff. And, uh, you know, Robert and I started working on the actual writing of the paper and um, putting together a timeline of it. And uh, I started doing some analysis on, on there's like three different, uh, three different events kind of reported in the whole constellation of stuff that went on in the report. And um, they all had, had extraordinary um, reports of, uh, you know, in uh, of abilities that, you know, people probably now pretty familiar with Tic Tac, uh, the Tic Tac case and Nimitz case, um, maybe, maybe not depending on people here if they're interested in the UAP phenomena. But um, uh, the, you know, I worked on the, a lot of appendices, you know, the, the, the primary part of the report uh, went through all of the backgrounds of the pilots and the people involved. It, it uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, FOIA reports were submitted to get, you know, so that, and the provenance of the video was trying to check out. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we thought it was valid. And, and, and the, uh, so we, we did a, a forensic report and uh, this is a little different in the sense that uh, you're taking something that hit in the past, kind of like a criminal case, forensic of a crime. We, we went through all of the data and uh, did a, a, I did a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the math calculations and the appendices about accelerations and power um, requirements, uh, assuming the object was one ton. And um, it, uh, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, this thing is just, uh, there's no way. Uh, so it, it, the, the way I approach these things is what I call the null hypothesis, which is you start out at being a scientist, you start out with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis in this null hypothesis is that the object you're studying is no different than uh, conventional objects. It's a misidentification. In our case, it would have to be an airplane or something, a drone or some kind of thing like that. And so the, uh, we try to prove that. What we found out was that you can't prove it with that. The characteristics are such that there's no known technology that we have. Uh, and you know, and this, is, this was in uh, 2004, you know, uh, even today we don't have anything like that that produces these kind of uh, uh, effects. And um, 
it's, uh, you know, and of course now it's become very public and once it gets on YouTube and all kinds of stories start up and um, UAPX was founded by, uh, you know, the, the people that were involved in the Nimitz, uh, much of the Nimitz case and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Knuth joined, joined them later. And uh, so uh, the, the, the approach that we want to take is that, you know, taking data and, you know, it's dull. I mean, it's not exciting uh, to, to a lot of people. You know, there's, we're not there with a lot of pictures and all kinds of stories about things that happen. We're just trying to, we don't know what these things are, uh, but we know, we know what they're not. And they're not something that we can currently produce, you know, and uh, that makes them anomalous. Uh, you know, anomalous means, uh, you know, anomalous comes from the Latin word for name, and A means not, it's not nameable, not understandable by our current technology. And uh, so uh, th this, uh, you know, like the, there's some very strange stuff going on out there, uh, like the Aqua D report, you know, that, that, that Rich worked on, um, of an object that, you know, it, it doesn't have any, uh, any particular uh, aerodynamic characteristics. It seems to fly along. It doesn't do anything extraordinary accelerations or anything like that, you know, it, but it's just uh, weird and it, you know, goes underwater and, uh, yeah, you can see the water lifting above it as you, as you go through the, the video and then it comes out and it splits in two and <laughs> you know very strange and uh same with the, the nimitz case these things go you know travel at thousands thousands several thousand g's in, in some of the reports and in the video uh we did an analysis using uh triangulation uh you know it's fairly simple math i mean this is not I, I'm not a physicist, you know, I, 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 I'm just using sort of, sort of, uh, you know, undergraduate level physics, you know, to do some you know, basic stuff. But the fact that the physics is simple makes you wonder why somebody hasn't done this before. And there's all kinds of stories, you know, and people come up with, uh, and if you just look into the analysis, uh, you know, you'll see that they're not true. It, it can't be true, but nobody wants to look at it. And, um, so, uh, you know, that's, um, uh, it, 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 it takes time, I, I mean, to, to do all this investigation. And so, uh, you know, people are not that interested in, uh, a lot of people just want to be entertained by it, by the, like TV program or something. So well, that's kind of a, something we're, we have to face. But my basic approach is that the SCU is not going to figure these things out but we can get the scientific community to take this seriously, that these reports are real things and worthy of investigation. And, and they're, you know, you know that th there's new, new science here. If, if we just learn something about this, uh, and some of these I think are natural phenomena, some kind of plasma effects, uh, the machines know, the machines have structure, you know, but some of these balls and stuff that do weird things uh, probably are new physics and stuff. And, you know, science should be interested in new physics, but some people, some scientists can't, can't investigate this because of the stigma involved. And that's sad. I mean, that's not the way science is supposed to be. We should be looking at new things. And so uh, that's my main motivation uh, uh, for this. And yeah, that's why I came into the, into the program. And, and I think, uh, you know, Rich has given a great overview of the SCU, and it shows, I, it shows that just with hard work and not a lot of, of publicity and trying to do things, that if you have quality, if you do things with quality, uh, people will start respecting it, and and that's kind of the approach that that I take. So, um, that's my background. We have I, as a director. Uh, Rich has, has talked about the different projects we have. And so uh, we don't generally, and those will all end up in reports that will become public. And some of them are technical, some less technical. Um, and uh, we, we look for new projects, but getting data is very difficult to get data. I mean, because, uh, well, a military has probably lots of data, but it's classified and they, 
are very strict and even uh, uh, places like Homeland Security or you know, uh, uh, FAA, those kind of things, uh, they're in silos somewhere, but the, the, they won't release them because uh, you, know, you need to, uh, you know, it's just not in the rules to do that. So that, that's kind of a big challenge we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, but we're hoping that as we get a reputation for being scientifically based, that people will trust us to uh, remain, uh, you know, that we, we won't be, um, they can be confidential, provide us the data and we'll do the analysis and then publish a report about it. Cause you know, some of these people, um, you know, people have had a, a close up experience of a machine like device, it shakes their life up. I mean, suddenly, I mean, they know it's not something, uh, you know, it's, it's, they know it's not something conventional. And, and even the nebulous things, uh, you know, very strange. I mean, it, 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 it shakes your, your, your idea of what reality is. And uh, so they, they want to tell somebody, but people laugh at them. You know, they, they, they go try and tell somebody. Some of the pilots uh, in, the, in like the Nimitz case, mentioned it to just some other pilots, but they would get, they would sort of get made fun of. And it was only after it became public and that recently that, you know, the Navy and the government is, uh, you know, Lou Elizondo, you know, uh, made this stuff available, these videos, and, um, you know, it, it had to leave his career to do it. And, uh, you know, has made, has helped make this progress to where, it's now starting to crack the barrier, you know, that to, to being investigating these things and not be so, um, you know, so uh, uh, dangerous to do it. And we're, um, uh, you know, uh, I, we're seeing a little of that. Uh, I, you know, in, uh, I recently was in a, uh, a, a conference with the AIAA, which is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, who uh, are concerned about flight safety uh, from this pr perspective. And, uh, you know, uh, they actually haven't really been able to do this because of the, the stigma associated with this. And so, um, you know, uh, there's a pilot, Ryan Graves, who, uh, a Navy pilot, uh, flew uh, F 18s out over the thing and has seen these things and he says they're very common you know, out there and he's very concerned about flight safety you know i mean you know you could run into one of these things because they don't you know they're not um they don't have no lights no communication no anything you know if, you, if they if you you could run your plane into one of them if they they seem to try to avoid uh, you know contact uh, that seems to be uh you know characteristics but you know we don't know uh, we don't know what you know, just well we need to understand it better uh, you know and then foreign pilots and pilots shouldn't have to worry about their career reporting these things you know it, it, it you know it, 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 this is a fundamental freedom we should be able to talk about these things and so uh, that's the um, uh, kind of summarizes it for me, um, you know, in, in my approach to how this, this thing is. But um, I, I do think we're making progress, it's slow, but uh, you know, it, I, I'm in for the long term as long as I, I can do it anyhow. Um, I don't think this is gonna be solved tomorrow, you know, or, you know, any, any quick, quick fixes like anything else, you know, and I'm, being an engineer, I'm used to working on projects that last a year and a half to get a product out, you know, and it's a lot of work, you know, a lot of detail, devils in the details. And uh, so I'll turn it over to Rich if you have any more. I'd be happy to, I mean, I go for a few more minutes and stuff like that and telling you a little bit about, you know, some of the things that I've been engaged in over my 57 years. I talked to you about investigating many, many thousands of cases. And so you talk about some of the things you were talking about in terms of like, you know, objects radiating heat. And, uh, you know, you're talking about objects that 
like, you know, we, we tend to like, you know, generalize to all UFO, UFO phenomena, if you would, or UAP phenomena, and we shouldn't do that. Um, you know, we just make assumptions that all craft are the same size, they're not. Uh, we, we assume that they have maybe the same propulsion systems. Uh, that may not be the case. Uh, you know, you're talking about objects that are maybe the size of like a, a grapefruit, or you're talking about an object that, that and, and some of these, you know, like, you know, are not natural phenomena, but more like even the disc-shaped objects. Uh, I had a, a pilot in 2013 that I was talking with that was leaving uh, uh, from the New Orleans, roughly in that area, and heading north, uh, was coming up near Stennis Air Force Base, uh, or the Stennis location where they do the test for all of the uh, rockets that we've got. Uh, and bottom line was uh, he is flying in a Cessna and he's got an object that's four feet in diameter that's silver that's underneath his wing. Uh, and it's it's following right along with him at 254 you know, miles per hour, maybe at about a 2000 foot altitude. And it stayed with him for a little bit and then decided to drop back and, and you know, you could have left it there and, and, and he went up and turned around and came back and he couldn't find it anymore. But, but, uh, had you left the case there, you would have missed the fact that that six we went to six different radar stations, FAA, and we managed to find the object being picked up on one uh, tracking station that was in Alabama, and you could actually see his you know his aircraft and position, and you could see that the object pulled back, like we talked about, and went from that 200, 200 miles per hour speed, if you would, and dropped back to being twenty five miles an hour. <laughs> So what was that, you know? I mean, so you've got, you've got objects that are, that are even connecting to the side of aircraft. Uh, you've got objects that, that have been reported. You've got cases where you've got objects that, that people have got up and touched. There was no heat associated with them. Uh, you've got objects in the thermal ranges uh, in many of the cases that we're starting to see now with these military grade kind of cameras where it appears that they're like in the Aguadilla case, it kind of like was around 104 degrees, but it, you know it was shifting in terms of its heat that it was picking up on thermal uh, to where you're seeing some of these things are, are relatively cold in the thermal. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, the go fast video, you'll see that that thing is white, and it's obviously colder than the ocean is, and and so you'll get mixtures of heating. Uh, You'll get some objects that are that are giving off electromagnetic effects that affect you know everything from people's cell phones to vehicles. Uh, not as much with the vehicles anymore, but um, in the past, you know, whatever that engine type we had with vehicles that was doing that. Uh, and you know, you've got objects that are that are uh, every shape. It seems like shape doesn't really matter. I mean, they they can perform yeah. whether they're square whether they're circular, whether they're a tic-tac shape, whether they're any kind of shape. I mean, we have dumbbell shaped objects that are reported. Yeah, I was so, gonna mention that, yeah. Yeah, dumbbell I mean, so- It's just phenomenally like, weird, you know. Yeah, and, and, so it, you know, you look at the five observables and you find out that the five observables are not a new thing related to the Nimitz. They've been going back since the 50s and the, and the 40s, you know, the same kinds of uh, similar kind of maneuvers, you know where it appears as though, uh, you know, there's no effect in the atmosphere. Sometimes there is an effect in the atmosphere. So it, it you know, again, it's why we want to study these things and why we want to look at them. And the exciting time for us now is the fact that people are starting to get beyond the visible range of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're starting to get data from those types of things, the thermal range, ultraviolet, and a whole host of others. And I think that that's going to help us to get some sort of an understanding of, of the objects that we've really never had before. Uh, yeah, I think anyway. that's uh, an important thing, you know, is that the, it's been the technological development of the, with, with in, common infrared cameras and uh, especially the targeting pods in, uh, you know, the military can actually uh, capture these things and track them now, which was really never possible before. Uh, you know, any kind of detail. And uh, that has, uh, you know, uh, you know, that, that has made it a much more sightings going on, you know, than, than there were before and, and become available. And uh, so, 
you know, that, that's what we need to do. I mean, as a civilian group, uh, I, I think we're going to have to collect our own data uh, because I don't think the, the government is going to likely release much to us uh, as you know, because it's mostly classified and they're worried that it'll give away uh, secrets about their you know, abilities and, and technology. Uh, and that's a big, that's something, you know, we're looking at uh, about how to move forward with that. Uh, there's going to have to be wide uh, coverage of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, data collection uh, to do it. Yeah, uh, we, we do know that there's a, a strong correlation between UAPs and nuclear. And so if you thought about it, you could create something called a honeypot, which basically lures whatever bees or various other, or these objects to the honeypot, if you would. And if you had that area located with, you know, all kinds of, you know, surveillance equipment and cameras and you name it, every kind of like equipment tool, you might be able to capture something. And that's something that's being explored both on the military side, as well as in the, the commercial side, if you would, uh, about uh, utilizing that. And so we're all also engaging uh, UFO DAP which is an organization, uh, or a, a, not an organization, but a product development by uh, Ron Olch, who is uh, developing these kind of like cameras and tools to be able to actually discern and dis distinguish uh, objects, natural objects from what may be unidentified. And you could position these tools uh, and having feeding data to us, and we could set these up in key locations uh, and then have them ship that basically that data to us and STU to be able to study. So that's one potential idea that we're looking at for collecting our own data that Peter mentioned. Uh, at the same time, I'm aware of some breakthroughs and potentially getting some data that is coming from other sources uh, that we might be able to look at. Uh, and P Peter doesn't know about that yet because we haven't had a chance to talk to him about it, but, but that's, 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 that's something that might be happening and we're excited about that. Uh, but Anyway, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that we're hopeful that we can we can start to really put ourselves to work and to actually get things like you know maybe meta materials and some other kinds of things to be able to study that will help advance uh, our understanding. 